great. I think this is a great opportunity for you to read a little bit from your book. Would you like to introduce uh, your book? Sure. I wrote this book called, there you go, The Landscape of Enlightenment, um, with doors and windows to the world. You know, it, I, I, I chose this title because not everybody understands what this landscape of enlightenment. Some people think this is an architectural book, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's really the architect architectural nature of consciousness. You know, when, when if you're walking down the street and you're looking at everything, it, it's an automatic experience. You see the trees, you see the sidewalk, cars might be passing. Consciousness is like that inside experience. It's just like that. You can see it and, and look at it. It's not, it's not any different other than it's inside. And at some point you recognize that all this stuff outside is happening in you. You're the, you're the experiencer, right? So it's kind of like a landscape. There's a foreground, a middle ground, and a distance, right? So consciousness is kind of like that. There's pure consciousness, which is in the background. There's this knowledge level or celestial level that's kind of in the foreground. And then there's an expanded field of knowingness that maybe includes the whole universe. Okay, so this is chapter 28 in this book, Landscape of Enlightenment. A discussion with friends. In my early days of meditating, I was sitting with a group of friends and the subject turned to personal experiences. I started to describe my experiences in a detailed way. I was rambling on about how there was this huge field of awareness that was always there in the background whether I was walking, talking, or whatever, and how it was so close that I felt that I never actually fell asleep at night and so on. As I was speaking, I gradually became aware that everybody was silent and staring at me. I realized for the first time that my friends had been talking intellectually about something that could happen perhaps in the future. To me, this field of consciousness was very clear and, and natural. Surely, I thought, this was everybody's experience. How could it possibly be missed by anyone when it was so obvious, I asked myself. This state of permanent, silent consciousness gradually expanded into a more refined, all-containing awareness through the expansion of my heart and mind. The abstract and bounded experience evolved into the direct perception of the divine levels of my own heart and mind. These very exquisite, beautiful experiences arose at the time. Arose at the time I began to practice the TM and the TM City program. I began to see and understand how the elements of nature, the sun, earth, air, water, fire, and so forth, are not only functioning components of my body, but also are the intimate constituents of the connectedness and experience of universal awakening. This unfolding of consciousness gradually developed into a delightful experience for the beautiful subtle sights, great joy and devotion to the creator and his her creation. During these experiences, which were intensely detailed and glorious that lasted for many years, there was almost no feeling of separation. There was a celestial sight right in front of me and in and around me with eyes open and closed and so clearly wonderful to my senses that I was constantly enthralled, enthralled by its divine nature. Time passed, and this divine unbounded awareness evolved further into what can be described as a more unified knowledge, when all the layers of perception served to reveal the togetherness in a grander way. Everything in my immediate environment began to be perceived in relation to my unbounded consciousness. A new element of deep understanding or knowledge pre present within and integral to the divine experience of themselves unified all the di all the different layers of my experience into one complete integrated perpetual totality. Okay. So that's kind of that's kind of a summary of what we've been talking about since the beginning of our interview, correct? And. Uh, that pretty well, pretty well sums up my experience, but you know, that took a number of years. It didn't happen in, you know, one week or two weeks or one month or two months, it happened over years. But, but still the first experience of self-awareness, conscious self-awareness 
that's what stayed steady. That's the, that's the easy one to get. That's the one that gives you the most satisfaction because suddenly, you know, you know, you, most people's lives are topsy turning like your students, right? They don't know where they're going. They don't know what the teachers are telling them. They don't know. They're not particularly happy most of the time. They have some anxiety, but that all comes from all this fluctuation and change in their lives, their emotions, their families, change, change, change. Self-awareness, conscious self-awareness is that one thing in life that develops that doesn't change. And you get this steadiness. And despite the change which continues, this, all this change and this turmoil in life becomes in relation to this steadiness that doesn't change. This self-awareness that stays and gives you a sense of um, stability, a sense of knowingness, a sense of quiet happiness like that. Um, how would you explain or the term God or um, how would yeah how would you interpret the word God for for uh, a general audience? How would you explain that? God, God to me is an experience, just like anything else. Okay, first of all, an experience. You could have an experience of with the senses. You could have an, it's just an intuitive feeling that, ah, oh, let me talk to God, and, and God is this big, uh, unbounded feeling. And I always wanted to see God. I mean, I wanted to know who, who the heck is God, and or God is, who, you know, this, you know, I've always had the sense that this universe was created by some, some being or in some, what, um, conscious way on a universal level. Well, that's just my, my feeling. So I wanted to know who that somebody, who that he or she was. And eventually, um, let's say this self-awareness became universal. Universal meant that not only was this fluctuations or these, this liveliness of the self on the individual level, they, they became lively on a cosmic level. Lively on a cosmic level means that getting closer to God, getting closer to the supreme being. Let's say the supreme being, let's say, you know, there's human beings and then there's what is the highest value of physical entity that exist, could exist, that would be God. And then eventually, you know, I began to see uh, a personal God, you know, and I, it would be a, there would be a physical sight that I saw but there wasn't much, there wasn't, there wasn't that much difference between me and God. Not that I'm God, but somehow the sight of God had the feeling of oneness to it. Not separation, the feeling of oneness. And that feeling is very comfortable and very uh, expanding and, and gives, um, what, concreteness and, and, takes away the abstract quality of self-awareness. Self-awareness is still there, self-awareness is there, but there is a, a God as if, as if out there and in there in my heart that exists as a supreme being. What else can I say? Yeah, that's interesting because um, how most people define God, he's, you know, all power, he or it is all powerful and everywhere. So then, so I feel like a lot of people must get the conclusion, like, wait, like my nature must be God as well, if God is everything. Um, but it, what, is, what really is the difference between like God, God in totality and our um, true selves? Is that the same thing or is God, because I, I, I experience like God, it must be greater, um, but still, there's this aspect of who, what I am is infinite as well, but I don't know if God is like a greater infinite. I don't know what you experienced from that. The, the feeling and experience that I get is that God is much greater than I am, has all kinds of powers. He, she created this universe, started it in motion. I don't feel I started the creation in motion. I'm the experiencer of that start, or I'm the experiencer of creation, and I have a 
oneness with that creation, but I didn't, cre I didn't create it. So as a consequence, I feel that God has these powers and these, these abilities that I can partake of as an experiencer rather than the fundamental cause of them like that. So yes, I think of God as something much greater, not, um, um, even though I say that, I feel that there's a continuity or connection between God and myself that is very intimate and very close, but not close in the sense that I'm God, close in the sense that um, we're divinely united. Right? God, since God created me and you and everything in creation, uh, I take that in a very reverential way and, and think of God. And, and I, you can think of God as knowing everything all of the time. I don't know everything all of the time. I don't have that kind of power. Nobody does. No human being does. But that doesn't mean you can't feel uh, oneness with God. God's in your heart and you can see God out there as well. Like that. Do you have an estimate as to why God created um, this, this sense that we aren't God? And like, I guess my last question is like, as humans, obviously we view ourselves as humans first and not God. Um, but what, what, was, what do you think is the purpose of God creating this world of uh, separate animals, plants, and humans? Well, I think there's a very simple answer to it. You know, even though God is God and is the creator of God, um, of the universe, God is not God unless God has a creation. You know, just like a father is not a father unless you have children, right? You're not a father. The, the creation makes the uh, makes the father. The creation makes God. I think God wanted, wanted to, you know, experience something, right? Just like we do. We we create houses and cities and this and that, and it's not all good. But, you know, we create them for our own enjoyment. God, on a cosmic level, uh, created creation to have the joy of his own expressions and, and, um, and to actually be God. You know, God means, God means that God made creation and creation actually makes God. You know, there's, there's sayings and ancient sayings that say things like, you know, God created creation, then entered creation, things like that. And human beings have the opportunity to partake of the knowledge of that experience. And it very joyous. I've had many experiences where I've, I've kind of uh, seen God and, and, and got very close to God, but I've never felt like I had his... I had, on an abstract level, I felt like I, I had his powers, but not on a, on a level where it act, I was actually creating universes. That's a totally different matter like that. That's interesting that you said that the universe is kind of God's enjoyment, because uh, I can see why some people might turn to atheism because they say, well, my life is kind of full of like stress and I don't have enough money. But how, how would you explain God um, and God's kind of project with this universe? to these kind of people who kind of are kind of living in their day-to-day -day lives and might be stressed? Step by step, you have to start somewhere. And the place to start is inside the self, you know, do, do something that will create a situation where there's some, some stability in your life. Uh, do a program or do self inquiry or, or go into some technique that develops self-awareness. Everybody, you already have some self-awareness. It's just not very permanent. It's not steady. Uh, develop that first and develop this, uh, this kind of field in which all these more positive phenomena that you want and where these negative values that you want to get out of don't have the same access to. And that would be, you can either meditate or you can, I don't know, you can become a Christian, but you know, generally speaking, you have to do something rather uh, specific. Uh, you can't just think your way out of your problems. You have to have a fundamental change to your consciousness. And I don't really see any other way to do it other than uh, some kind of uh, prayer or technique. 
and then this self-awareness or conscious self-awareness that develops will give you the basis in which these up and downs of your life can at the very least be in relation to that stable base that you have. In other words, they won't necessarily totally disappear, but they won't be have the same overpowering influence because essentially you're this non-changing eternal being and you know that you are and all this stuff in your life that's continuing to go on um, um, doesn't overshadow that experience. There's no other way. And a teenager is the same as an adult. They have to get into something. You know, you can't drink your way to heaven and you can't surfboard your way either. You can have a lot of fun in life. I'm not saying you don't stop any of that stuff, but it isn't going to happen if you don't go after it. You've you got to go after it. You've got to, in some way, do something to develop self-awareness. You know that. I think everybody, and they... They kind of know that it's just that life grabs them and they forget it, right? Yeah, it seems like as long as people find the inner motivation to find um, truth and happiness, rather than what the path really is, because it's. I wonder, would you, would you say that most people, um, like there are many many different paths. There's not there's not just one path. I think life in general is a path. It's a, it's a cosmic path. All of us are evolving. It doesn't matter how slow we're evolving. We're all evolving. And, and eventually we'll all reach some kind of contentment. It's just that we're at various stages. If you want to go faster, if you want to go uh, move in the direction of this, uh, where there isn't so many ups and downs to your life, then you have to do something consciously for it. And you get on a path, and usually getting on a path is you know you 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 limit some of the bad things, some of your bad habits, right? And and you go after you maybe you start TM or you do Zen or you do prayer, and usually you're you know you say don't go there and don't go there, do this instead for a while, and then you know. But if you don't. If you don't consciously go after something more significant than, you know, watching television, then, you know, that's what your life will be. Which that's, unfortunately, you know, it, it's not that you have to strain or do anything uh, particularly hard because uh, the evolutionary process of existence is already geared towards evolution, geared towards growth, right? And happiness is something that can be cultivated. Uh, Self-awareness is something that can be cultivated. Just like the physiology can be cultivated. The mind can be cultivated. The heart can be cultivated. I personally did meditation and still do meditation, TM meditation. I've done it for 30, 40 years now. And I don't really know any other techniques, but I, I do know people who have evolved using other techniques. So. For people who are really into meditation, how do you, um, what advice would you have for them to bring that sense that they have while they're meditating into their daily life? How do they translate it? If the technique is precise and comes from a long tradition of, you know, you know, thousands of years, teachers and mentors that have evolved this technique, the technique itself should have and does have the ability where you don't think your way to it, it. The technique itself is automatic and takes care of the uh, your idiosyncrasies and your problems and, and, and sets in motion those qualities in you that are already there but weren't developing in the right way. Something like that. In other words, what I'm really saying, you know, a good technique is automatic. It, it does does all those beneficial things without you consciously um, having to do them. They start happening. And and when this person like has their first awakening experience, or even that they they reach that first stage of an, kind of enlightenment or awakeness, um, what should they expect uh, further down the line? 
that's an interesting question indeed. The, the, the stages that I've gone through and the stages that I've seen other people go through is that the very first experience of self-awareness is, is very fundamental and very simple. And sim by simple, I mean is there's this suddenly something happens to the mind and the heart and and you say, whoa, is this what I've been waiting for all my life? Is this why I'm here? Is this what I'm, is this my, is this my, is this my experience of self-awareness? You know, the enlightenment, once a person wakes up, that word enlightenment doesn't mean anything anymore. It, it kind of disappears. Enlightenment is such a natural state that that's a good, that's a good thing to aim for. But once you get it, it's like, you know, you've suddenly got the Olympic gold. You're not striving for it anymore. You want it. You want it, right? You, you put it on a shelf, you got it, you know, and how can I describe it? In my own experience, it, all these states, I think it's easier for me to describe when I want, you know, it's, for me, it had started so many years ago and so young, but, you know, when I watch people much older or middle-aged and they go through this transformation called awakening, what I saw is that is that they, they get grounded they get stabilized. Everything remains the same. The senses remain the same. The body remains the same. You look the same. Maybe you look a little more rested and this, that, and the other thing. But they realize that there's been a very significant, I hate to say it, very significant non-change in their lives. By non-change, I mean you're the, same. you're the same individual. You're the same person. You're the same being. Your friends like you. If they didn't like you before, they're not going to suddenly like you, etc., etc. But the, I guess from my perspective, because I hold little, you know, we, we have little group meetings where we talk about experiences and stuff like that. What I notice when somebody wakes up, I can't talk to them the same way anymore. They suddenly know too much. I'm no longer trying to tell them what self-awareness is. They know what self-awareness is. Talk to me about something bigger than that. Talk to me of what's, what is self-awareness. Tell me something about a higher state than just simple silence. Because that's what they're interested in. Somebody. Up until that point, all they're into, well, what is it? What is the thing you're talking about? Who, who, who do you think you are? And so forth. You know, it's like it, the intensity of the path drops away and you start wanting just more and more of the goal like that. Now, why do, why do you think some people, once they do kind of achieve that first stage of awakening, and they say that, like, the world is an illusion, what do you think, what is that motivation? Like, wh why would they say something like that? I don't think anybody who wakes up to, uh, well, I guess you could. The, the thing is, at first, the experience is very uh, simple, right? And expanding and abstract. And, but after a while, a little, and not very long, the experience begins to wake up even more. This waking up starts, uh, starts showing you what you, who you really are. What, what is the knowledge that you've actually gained? What is the vision that you've actually gained? And the vision that you've gained is that everything is this unboundedness. And the illusion is that there is no illusion. The illusion is the, that the illusion is the illusion. Everything is the self. Everything is known as the self. And, you know, in, in the TM organization, Marishi's talked about 200% rather than 100%, right? So this 200% means it's 100% absolute and 100% relative. And my experience has been that that the so-called physical life and, and, and material life and material existence takes on whole new qualities. Um, and there are, there are, you know, particularly in India and, and places like that, you know, there are 
techniques where recluses, you know, they're supposed to be out in the mountains and not get involved in, you know, normal family life, you know. So to them, they call everything across the river or down in the valley, uh, they call all that a big illusion. And to them, it is a big illusion. Now, to people who live in the world, it's quite the opposite. And it's my opinion that that the connectedness between the outside and the inside that makes the unitative state or makes the self-aware state far more joyous that you get to have it all. You get the icing and the cake. You know, the icing <laughs> The icing is, is our regular life. It gets to be more joyous and happy and so forth. And you have your inside life. And, and the connectedness between the silence, the uh, subtle levels of your own knowledge and consciousness, and physical life, it all joins into this one see-through, wonderful totality that is is the uh, totality of existence. And that's what enlightenment is, is kind of experiencing a kind of simple totality or simple uh, togetherness of all the different layers. Would, would you advocate for some people to maybe go on a long meditation retreat but um, maybe not stay there forever, obviously, kind of the need to, or the um, ne ne uh, necessary component of being back into society and kind of experiencing kind of the liveliness of awakeness? Absolutely. I went through, uh, some years ago, I went through long uh, meditation courses and, and they were all TM organization. they will be six months. I'd go six months into kind of a We'd go to Switzerland or Italy or somewhere in the mountains, and, and we'd have um, essentially, you know, you'd be on this course and, we, and you'd pretty well stay in the hotel and do longer meditations and things, and they were very, very beneficial, yes. But they're more for people after you've started and after you've uh, meditated for a long, longer time and you decide, yes, uh, I want to go even faster. I want to get to the goal quickly. Yes, so I do recommend them, but not at the beginning. They're more advanced. More advanced. I have this funny story, you know. You know, this was way early on. I lived in the country, you know, typical hippie. Wife and I were typical hippies, you know. Lived in the country, long hair and all that. And um, I started TM. You know, Kathy and I, my wife, we started TM, and you know. And then I've been meditating a few years, and, and the TM organization offered these longer meditation courses. And one of these courses, um, the criteria for getting onto this, which course, there were three different courses you could get on. Was, there was a nil experience, um, and, and uh, intermediate experience, and, and clear experience. And so, so I said, well, nil, I have silence, you know, I have this wonderful unbounded silence, stillness, I've had this for years. So I went to this course, which was then, you know, got accepted and went to this nil course. And when I got to the course, I realized what they meant by nil was no experience whatsoever of any kind. <laughs> so I'm just bringing this up, but it is awfully easy to, unless you had the understanding of what you're experiencing, you could very easily call it no experience. You know, it's quiet, it's still, it's, yes, there's light there, but you know, it's very abstract. And, and um, but it's not really like that at all. There's, a, you know, just to go back for a moment to this, you talked about the, the disillusion and silence and all that. The, I don't think any of these processes that people do are incorrect. Let's call them partial. You know, you do this technique or you do that, get into that teacher and they teach you this much. And, you know, maybe it's only 50%, but at least you got 50%. It's better than 0%. You know, that's how I tend to look at it. I tend to look at TM gave me a lot more, you know. And in the end, you're going to do it yourself nothing outside is going to do it for you. They help you, just like lifting weights or, or, or self-inquiry. 
It's called self-inquiry. It's not called your inquiry. It's your own inner inquiry that will eventually give you the knowledge like that. What does the role of love play in the whole um, kind of realm of awakening? Well, that's, that's a beautiful question. You know, the, one of the things about I've always found it slightly hard to talk about love. It's like it, it's such a delicate thing and you bring it into the light of day, you're almost afraid it's going to disappear if you do that. You know what I mean? And, but you could just as well call self-awareness love awareness and you'd be just as correct. It wouldn't be, you. it actually is closer to the truth. It just sounds too corny, <laughs> right? So there is a quality, self-awareness has a quality of love. There is a love quality, just like your dearest friends or your dearest family, you have the sense of love to them. If you were to give yourself a feeling of universal love, you know, a more expanded abstract value of love, then, then, then and then you still maintain your specific love for your family or friends or whatever. So you have this universal love, which is the self. Self-awareness is a kind of love. Uh, it's an integrated, quiet, soft love of the heart. And if on an abstract universal level, and its concentrated value is what you feel for your friends and your family and so forth. So to have both of those loves would be the grand goal of your existence, really. And is because I, I feel like if some people awake, um, then are uh, enter enlightenment, they kind of see it as maybe they did it. Um, but if it feels like if you do kind of enter into this realm of enlightenment, there's still other other people. And I, do you think that interaction um, between people does that play a role in awakening as well? Like, does it increase the sense of love that you have in your heart when you're awake, um, when you're interacting with others? Absolutely. And I would say that uh, it greatly expands it because your sense of sight and your sense of hearing and your sense of uh, physical involvement in the environment these are all aspects of the knower moving through the knower or the knower moving through the self or the uh, experiencer having more tangible experience of the self. There's, there, you know, once pure consciousness or self-awareness evolves, it becomes more of a, um, rather than a separate experience, it becomes an experience of unity. This unified sense of experience with the outside and the inside our experience is one experience um, has a quality to it that has this intimacy or love to it. And the experience of self-awareness becomes a unified experience rather than a separation. And this unified experience is infinitely greater than just the experience of silence and sight. So yes, you're very correct about that. Um, if it's okay, if you could, uh, read one more passage uh, in your book. I don't know if there's um, one that you have in mind to read for us at this point. Well, this isn't the one I thought, but why not? You know, why does the experience of self-awareness not feel enlightened? Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. The enlightened mind is the natural condition of human consciousness. Many cultures have developed rituals, systems, and techniques to acquire this experience. Great people, regular people, spiritual teachers, gurus, both modern and of old, as well as the indigenous cultures of many nations, write and speak glowingly about enlightenment. They all say that the goal of human life is to be happy, acquire full understanding, achieve immortality. Many traditions have come to regard this goal as unattainable for the regular person. However, we are all thoroughly and uniquely equipped through our physical
physiologies, hearts and minds to reach these higher states of experience. My experience of pure awareness developed through a series of innumerable short to long or many awakenings that over time added up to an increasingly grand, increasingly integrated awareness. The knowledge that I gained stayed around longer and longer until finally it stopped coming and going altogether and simply remained conscious and accessible within one grand and undivided luminous reality. As an artist, my experience often started visually and developed from there. All, all of us are different and inevitably we all developed in our own ways. The reality of existence is fundamentally the same for all of us, but it, but it is experienced and spoken of from a different perspective in every case. I came to realize that whatever was happening to my heart and mind was also happening to my body. In fact, the whole story revealed itself as spontaneous connecting to swear in the enrichment of any one aspect of my life enhanced many other aspects as well. It was always an addition to the whole. The idea of enlightenment, enlightenment is an imagination for someone on the path who is anticipating it for the future. To a person of realization, it does not even feel like a specific state. It simply is. A person who is alert to the self would not say that they are self-conscious any more than a person walking outside would say, do you know that I can walk? It seems absurd to claim the obvious. So what is the relationship between the awakening process and what you feel in your body? Hmm. The mind and body and heart are obviously intimately connected, right? If there's, if there's any kind of stability in the mind and it isn't going up and down, up and down in this, this way, then, then the stresses and strains of, of daily life are affecting the body, right? It's obvious that when a person is stressed, they're having a tough time, not just on, in the mind, but their body is having a tough time too. Now, so if you develop a state where the mind is established, is more stable, then the body will also be more stable and the body will not feel the highs in quite the same way or the lows in quite the same way. It, it'll be stabilized and, and wherever the, when, whenever the mind gains stability of consciousness, the body also gains and the heart gains and the senses also gain. So this gaining of, of stability of self-awareness, subconscious self-awareness or self-realization um, has the same effect on the body that it has on the mind. You get you get a sense that life is life is stable, eternal, and goes on and on and on. And you are the recipient of that stability and the recipient of that stillness that is the that is the birthright of every human being. And will people in this awakening process, will they feel kind of a, an energy that's maybe not a normal physical energy kind of enter into their, maybe their nervous system or something? I've heard, I've heard of Kundalini energy. I don't know if um, that's a normal process in awakening. In the same way that if you get healthy, let's say you're not healthy, but then you get healthy, you feel energy, right? You feel physical energy during the day. And Yes, you can have all kinds of flashy experiences. You know, I've had lots of experiences in particularly in bygone years of Kundalini and this and that. But, you know, any experience that comes and goes is satisfying while you have it and then it's gone. So what we really want is we want a sense of happiness and a sense of integration and a sense of uh, stability and bliss that sticks around that's there all the time. And yes, there, you can have Kundalini, but Kundalini is something that, you know, generally speaking, it comes and it goes. You know, it's, it's a part of the process. It can be blissful or it can be not so blissful, but nevertheless, it's usually part of the path uh, on the way to realization. 